to be talking about financial um, inclusion and in particular the sort of digital front of the um, struggle for financial um, inclusion. Um, uh, we're delighted to be here um, with Cass and to um, celebrate the launch of this new report which um, hopefully most of you have got a copy of, if not there's lots of them upstairs and it's, it's really quite a good run round the issues with a range of industry specialists and journalists um, looking at the questions of financial inclusion of um, the data aspects of that that are only getting more relevant. Indeed, um, within the last few days, I think on Friday, the Treasury Select Committee um, launched a uh, review into much of the territory that we're um, going to be um, exploring tonight. So um, as far as the politicians are concerned, we're on something that um, their mailbags are telling them that we really do need to care about. Um, we, um, I'll introduce the panel one by one when we get going. I should just say a word about um, uh, someone who we're hoping is going to join us, which is um, Guy Opperman, um, the responsible um, uh, minister, who is currently, as always happens um, with... Uh, when you've got evening votes, he's got a, um, a whip on at the moment, but we're hopeful there's a chance he'll um, come along and uh, join the conversation. But we're going to get going without him, obviously, um, before that. But if you get some disruption in 20 minutes after the voting is done, that's what that's all about. Um, and the other sort of point of housekeeping I just wanted to make is, um, like, um, it's often true at prospect events, but I think it's especially true tonight that the, um, got lots of expertise here, I hope, I think, on the panel, but we've also got lots in the room. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do the panel discussion, but then we'll be especially interested in the questions and comments from the floor, because we all know that we can learn from you as much as the other way around, we've got a real blended sprinkling of um, uh, both um, academic and industry um, expertise with us as well. And so, um, uh, without further ado, um, uh, I think I'll introduce um, Anne, who is um, going to tell us um, uh, a little bit about um, the research you've been doing, is that right, on the, on the broad area of financial inclusion? look at all the people that I've been working with and sharing some of our debate. I'm not sure if I'm on or not. Sorry, you're worried about the microphone? Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. No. Oh, right. I'd say Earl on the sound <laughs> of speak. It seems I'm much more mic than you from where I'm sat. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'm saying it's absolutely wonderful to see everyone around us and also for the people that have contributed to this report. I actually am really proud of this report. It's been a, a fantastic co collaboration. It's taken a while to come together, but I think it actually reflects the actual interest in what we are talking about here tonight. So I was actually going to start off by really talking about the current account switch service, of which some of you know around here. But more importantly, to start off and say how proud I am actually to have been given the, the opportunity to not only develop the service, but run the service, and also look to the future of the service, but working with a number of people that are so passionate about what we are doing, as I am. So little, what we were talking about here is actually, just to remind ourselves, CAS is run as a not-for-profit organisation, and that actually means that we're able to put the needs of the switch ecosystem first. We're now part of a larger organisation, and that's Pay, and I've been told dot UK, and I've got we've got Anna Bradley here, who's poised to take a, a question later on on the end user council if required. But actually, that allows us to engage with all sectors to act as a market catalyst, helping to ensure that the central infrastructure provides a level playing field for established banks and new challengers. And I'm pleased to see that Monzo are on the panel tonight. Of course, but what we do need to do is actually listen to what the market requires, ensuring that our switch service continues to be relevant to those changing times, but also promotes services to those that need it most. 
Many of you will have seen our research papers and these outline why consumers are very slow to change their banking arrangements and for many a switch is actually prompted by a lifestyle change. So getting married, going to university, retiring or getting a bank account for the first time. Suddenly something may happen that changes your personal circumstances and I know that Chris you've talked a lot about this but I'm more important that Helen's here today and I'm sure she will bring that forward. But those, it, but more importantly, we, must, we can agree that some may struggle to get access to a bank account. And we know that overdraft users and those with money to invest also need services to access the market. As mentioned, we're really passionate to ensure that a level playing field, and we've worked very hard to understand two things. What a well-functioning market should look like and what its driving consumer needs. So what are the different customer needs and what enables customers to take that step? In essence, our research shows us that everyone wants to have security and confidence in the product or service that they choose. They must have confidence that their bills will be paid and that they will receive income and the product will not change without their consent. Most importantly, it's got to have relevance. The service features must live up to the promises that are made. But the world is rapidly changing and the features available are becoming more complex. And it's vitally important that we work together to ensure that those customers who have more complex needs or customers who are not digitally enabled are not left behind. So that's why we're here and that's why we prompted this debate and we had our white paper out earlier this month. As we can all agree that the banking system evolves, we need to understand what this means to our consumers. Some may want to keep all of their eggs in one basket and they may want a variety of products and services as a hub and spoke type model. We were talking about that earlier. Um, where a bank account is the hub and a payment provider is a spoke. Others may want products that are bespoke to them. Open banking developments may provide them with the information they require to ensure they get precisely the right product. But I think that we can all recognise that inclusivity, a system that works to guarantee access to basic financial services that consumers need to live their lives is actually paramount. So to summarise, I had to write that down tonight because it's so important to us in the CAS community and the team that I've got because we wanted to get the message across here today is that we all recognise that the ecosystem <coughs> is rapidly changing and as a result we believe that customer needs are becoming ever more complex and it's therefore vital that we all work together and pool our understanding and knowledge to ensure that the market continues to function for all users and not just a subset. And that's why I'm really looking forward to a very vibrant discussion today. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And that really um, brought to life um, why, why all this stuff that can get quite technical and quite complicated mattered, because it is just about people's need to be able to live their lives, which um, if you're excluded from banks and from tapping in and tapping out and all the rest of it, you are excluded these days in a way that a generation ago wouldn't have been um, true. And of course, it's therefore also incumbent on the banks to um, adjust to the ways that people live their lives, which can be very complicated indeed. And I think Helen, who's here from Money and Mental Health, might have some reflections on some of that, how people with maybe more complicated lives bump up against the banking system and how the banking system bumps up against those people. Yes, of course. So well, I am on, so I'm quite loud. Um, so I'm Helen, I'm the director of the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute. We're a small research charity and we do work to try and understand and help tackle that link between financial difficulty and mental health problems. And the world, the world of banking and of fintech is obviously just one part of that, but it's the bit that I'm going to focus on today. Um, the other bits being particularly around mental health services and, and around work. So 
people with mental health problems are three times as likely to be in financial difficulty. That's why we exist at Money and Mental Health and it's why uh, I think why I was invited here today to speak because this is such an important issue for that group of people which is one in four of all of us. So that's a quarter of the population who are three times as likely to be in financial difficulty. And that's for three real reasons. One is that living with a mental health problem means that it's likely that your income is going to go down. So this is the bit around work, around benefits, making sure that people have enough money to live on. The second is that at the same time as your income is likely to go down, our research found that your expenditure is likely to go up. And that is for two reasons. One is that your costs go up. So if you are at home all day, your heating bills are likely to be higher. If you struggle to take public transport or to cook using convenience foods and taking taxis is more expensive. But quite often it's because our ability to control our impulses and to make good financial decisions is impaired. Our spending goes up in part because when we're feeling really bad, shopping makes us feel good. Uh, and that's not something that should come with shame or something that we should stigmatise. But actually for a lot of people, staying in control of their spending in a period of really acute illness is very hard. And the third reason is that as your income is likely to be going down and your expenditure going up, your ability to manage the mismatch between those two things is reduced. And that's the bit where I think there's an enormous potential for financial technology and for the banking industry more broadly to make an enormous difference and to make a contribution, um, both in providing the sorts of products and tools that can help people to manage their money, um, but also in tackling some of that uh, impulsivity. So at the same time that your uh, mental health problems are likely to be affecting how you feel, our research suggests that they affect how you think. So they affect the way that we manage our money. They affect the way that our minds work. So that can be things like short-term memory loss, so the evidence is very clear that conditions like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and some of the medications that we take for those conditions affect our short-term memory, which on a very practical level makes it really difficult to remember banking passwords. It makes it really hard to remember the conversation that you had with your bank about making a repayment against your debt. It makes it much harder to weigh up the information when you're choosing a product and remember which product had the bigger, um, which insurance product had a higher uh, premium and which insurance product offered a better deal over the long run. So memory is just one example. And we've seen a lot in the financial services world about improving access to login through things like fingerprint and uh, voice recognition. And often that's talked about in terms of oh, improving access for everybody, but actually it could disproportionately improve access for those who need it the most, so long as it comes with the right kind of protections and tools to make sure that it's developed uh, to protect people from harm as well as to enable them to use products and services. And that's where this impulsivity bit comes in. So we need to increase access to financial products that have the kinds of tram lines and protections available within them that we would all like to use in our day-to-day -day lives. So for example, when you decide to go on a diet and you throw out all the unhealthy food in the house or mm. you don't buy biscuits because you know that at 11 p.m. you're much more likely to go and get them out of the cupboard and eat them even though you've decided in your own mind that that's not what you want to do. That's something that everybody experiences in much the same way you might have decided that you want to spend a certain amount this month, that you don't want to splurge on a, a big purchase, or that actually taking out new credit right now isn't something that would be a good idea for you. Um, we can all be subject to temptation, but in periods of really poor mental health, your ability to control those impulses is reduced yet further. And so the ability to be able to make a decision and say, I would like to limit my own access to credit. I would like to set a spending control on my debit card to say that I can only spend £100 a week or I can only spend um, £50 on this particular merchant category code of spending would be really useful. And there is some of this out there at the moment. So um, we have done some work in particular looking at gambling and 
you might be aware that Monzo have introduced uh, a new gambling block, uh, which I think is fantastic. And I'm not just saying because Monzo are here, Starling have also introduced a gambling block. Um, but one of the important things about that is that it builds some friction into turning it off again. So uh, in Monzo's one, there is a cooling off period before you can turn that back on, which is really important so that you can so that you don't just toggle it on and off, if that makes sense, mm. so that you make a decision that you want to exclude yourself. Um, and then there are certain hurdles that you have to cross to get back in. It's using friction in a positive way. And increasingly in a financial services and retail environment, we're taking the friction out of spending decisions and out of decisions about taking out credit, which on the one hand, as I've said, can be useful in terms of allowing people access to a product when you can't remember your password, so long as the parameters are in place that you can also put some useful controls on your own behaviour. Um, and then there were two other things that I wanted to reference. One is that the power of banking and financial technology to help people with mental health problems doesn't just need to be about the front end. So it doesn't just need to be about apps and tools that are in your phone or things that you might use yourself. They can also be uh, about the back end for firms themselves. So for example, the power to analyze large quantities of transaction data to identify changes in behavior and changes in spending, which we already do very accurately to identify and respond to fraud. There's no reason why with the right ethical considerations and with the right parameters around it, we couldn't explore the potential to use that kind of data to identify somebody who might be struggling and to offer additional support and help. But there are risks associated with doing that. And it's important that we don't rush headlong into these things without considering them, which is why at Money and Mental Health, we've been trying to be part of the fintech debate around open banking and around the tools and products that are available from the beginning, um, because it's happening. So we want to make sure that it's happening in a way that empowers people, in a way that um, isn't discriminatory so that you wouldn't, in using somebody's data to identify someone who might offer might benefit from being offered support, also use that to deny them access to products and services. Um, so we've developed a set of principles for financial technology and for the banking world and thinking about designing products and services with mental health in mind. But I'm looking forward to the discussion because I'm sure there are going to be lots of additional suggestions about both the potential, but also some of the risks as well. Have you got just a few of those, two or three of those principles? If they're nice yeah, and so... Um, well, so number one is that it can't be discriminatory. So yeah. if you um, establish that somebody has a mental health problem because they tell you, they're entrusting you with their information, um, you shouldn't use that in order to then discriminate against them and deny them access to products and services. Um, it needs to be empowering. So if somebody tells you that they struggle to control their spending because they have bipolar, you might want to offer them some spending controls, but you shouldn't spot that they have bipolar and then limit their spending. Mm. So that would not be an empowering way to use financial technology. Um, it should be co-produced wherever possible. Yep. So it's just good it's just good design to involve your users in the products that you're developing. One in four of your users have mental health problems. If your users are people with finan in financial difficulty, half of your users have mental health problems. So unless you are explicitly talking to people who have mental health problems and who can draw on that in their um, feedback on your products and services, you're missing part of the picture. And it also risks, particularly when you get into the trickier ethical areas around um, around identification and spotting patterns and changes mm. in behaviour, that if you don't involve people in those conversations at the beginning about what they want to do, then you end up overstepping what's kind of ethically and morally appropriate, but also facing a huge backlash from customers who don't want it. Shades of, of, of the tech giants there, which I thought we might we might yeah. come back to and some of the some of the dilemmas in, in, in regulating and running those things. Um, but thank you very much indeed. Lots of great insight um, there. And now um, we're delighted to be joined by Daniel, who's from Monzo, and he'll tell us more about Monzo. And uh, it's, it's got it's getting quite big quite quickly, isn't it? Yes. Um, so the banking industry is going under, uh, undergoing a lot of change. And at Monzo, we're quite excited to be a, a part of that change. Um, I've been at Monzo since the company was 15 employees and zero customers. And we now have 500 employees 
I don't actually know, at least 500 employees and more than a million customers. Um, and it's been kind of exciting to kind of be on that, that journey uh, from having our very first customer to having our, our millionth customer. And so we're a new bank, we're an app only bank. Um, uh, we launched in, well, we, the company was founded in 2015 and we launched in, in 2016. And like part, part of that journey is lots of small things, real time notifications, budgeting features, 24-7 uh, customer support, all that have kind of incremental improvement with people's relationship with their, their money, their finances, and their bank. And then some of the changes that we made, for example, Gambling Block, have, can have quite profound change on, on a small segment of our customers, granted, but like have a really kind of life-changing impact on, on some of our customers. So one of our customers, Danny, um, who we went we developed the gambling block in quite close collaboration with him getting his feedback around, would this work uh, in your kind of circumstances before we test, tested with more people? Uh, he, he had a, a gambling addiction and um, he's, he's now past that gambling addiction. It's, he's always going to be addicted to gambling, but he, he's now on top of his finances. Um, and he credits largely that to, to the gambling block feature that, that we released. And that, I think, is a good example of where kind of changes can have such a large improvement uh, on people's lives. However, there's also a risk. So as the benefit that people draw from, from their banking relationship changes over time and increases and things move more and more digital, the, the impact on those that are excluded from those services will also increase. Um, there's already a large uh, impact on people that don't have basic uh, banking functionality and over time that's just increasing. And financial inclusion isn't really getting much better. Uh, so it's it's kind of time for a rethink with kind of the, the strategy across the industry and regulation on like in five years, how can we radically improve this situation rather than just every year it staying basically the same. Uh, just tell us a little bit more about how these controls work and how you don't end up in the situation. I think Helen was talking about where you can just switch on and switch off, try and be good for a bit and then find that you just need to remember this password and... And then you're back gambling again. Yeah, so I was actually the engineer that built Gambling Block. Um, and I was very naive. I haven't done any research in this space. So initially when uh, we were discussing building Gambling Block, I was like, oh, simple. We'll just have an on-off button. Because I, I did, I just, I've just, i not had a gambling problem. I didn't foresee the, the, the problems that these individuals have. And then in talking to some of these people and kind of gaining that insight of like, that's just not how it works. Like, hmm. At the point at which you want to do a gambling transaction, you will just turn it back on. Like, it's like you're drunk. It's like you're in a different mental mental mode. Um, you need to have this this calling off period where you need to. So in our case, you have to talk to a, a specialist and a vulnerable customer team, uh, and they'll talk you through. Like, are you sure you want to do this? Ultimately, if if you say that that's what you want to do, we're not going to stand in your way. But we will make you wait forty eight hours because very very frequently someone will go through that process, and then within that forty eight hour period they'll see sense and they'll say, oh, can't cancel that. Um, actually, I don't, don't want to do that. And I think it's a, it's a good example of that positive friction um, that was mentioned, where as we move to a more and more digital world where everything is really, really easy, moving money is easy, sometimes that increases the risk of certain things, like in this case, impact on someone's mental health, some other cases, fraud. So like faster payments are becoming more and more common to use that as a, as a method of, of paying for lots of different things and open banking will increase that further and this has had a large increase in the amount of fraud that is, is conducted by that, that payment channel and we're going to need to kind of as an industry work out how do we make sure we stay ahead of the, those kind of risks and co combat them effectively. Great stuff, thanks very much. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting, isn't it, thinking about how fast all of this is changing. You know, we all know that we're, every time you get on a bus now, even you, you, you're paying in a, in a different way and technology is just uh, involved in the relationship between you and your money in a, a way that it didn't used to be. And I imagine for lots of socially excluded people, the effects of that could be both quite liberating or could be terrible and maybe particularly for some older people who worry a lot I mean we're not specifically talking here about branch closures but obviously that's a big thing behind the Treasury's new Treasury Committee's new um, report and I wondered if you had thoughts any of you um, but let's not let's end um, uh, on the um, 
on the sort of balance between those two, the, the, the kind of the opportunities on the one hand, like, I mean, that wouldn't have been available, would it? A sort of limit on gambling, a way of tying yourself to the mast if you've got a problem with spending on the one hand. But then on the other, the loss of the kind of um, human concept and how you weigh those, those two things and ensure it works out for the best for vulnerable people. I was actually uh, tying on the friction versus non-friction, to be honest. I, mean, I was tying it back to this because I love my contactless car to, to pay for my tube journeys, etc. But I do think when we built the CAS service, we did actually look at how we could map the account so that we can make it faster to actually transfer your account. We did a lot of research at that stage, mm. and what we actually found was... We had to build the account, the, the process to enable all of the things that go on behind the scenes. So that we did have some uh, elements to that, but it's very much from a customer perspective. They didn't mind how lo long it actually took for the accounts to be transferred. It was very much for them. It was actually, is it safe? Is it secure? And what happens if something goes wrong? So mm. I think I'm picking up your your question in a slightly different way. Is mm. that People are concerned. These are the, you know, particularly current accounts. This is their, their only way of actually paying for bills or receiving monies. They don't want to do anything different. And we found that by actually researching um, why don't people really move their accounts. And one of the things we were talking about earlier, a lot of research that says actually people don't trust their banks, but they trust their own. And when you think about that, that doesn't quite compute. They will stay with their own bank. They don't like it, but actually they will say that they, they trust their bank because it's safe, it's secure, it mm -hmm. pays their bills, and they are actually they don't feel that they're a risk of actually uh, fraud. Um, so come to my main point on this is that actually sometimes friction is a good thing, and actually that enables people to, to, to take that leap of faith. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thought. I hadn't, I hadn't had it before tonight, this yeah. business about friction. But Helen, in what you look at, is, is there a, um, lots of things you're talking about there could affect people of any age, but do you notice an age gradient where there's different sorts of problems in getting used to this stuff with people of different ages? Or perhaps I'm being prejudiced, I don't know. Um, that's an interesting question. So one of so one of the issues that we found in our research was about um, and this cuts across all essential services actually not just financial services but difficulties people have accessing a service and and using the basic functionality um, and one of the areas where there was an age difference was around using the telephone so we found that over half of people with mental health problems said that they have significant difficulty using the telephone and uh, we'd set a very high bar for what that significant difficulty is. We actually used a clinical social anxiety screener. So that's not just people saying, I find it really hard to make a phone call. That's people who are experiencing panic attacks, heart palpitations, sweating. Uh, people who either find the telephone call incredibly difficult or for whom the impact of the telephone call afterwards is very high. So when financial services are designed, quite often a telephone call is what is needed in order to uh, complete some of the functionality, and particularly mm. when you get to areas around reporting concerns about fraud um, or accessing vulnerable customer teams. So most banks will have a team who have additional training in order to help people, including people with mental health problems which is ironically largely only accessible by the telephone, um, so largely inaccessible to a lot of people with mental health problems. But we found in the research that actually younger people are also more likely to struggle with using the telephone. Um, mm -hmm. It's a bit of a sort of cliche, but uh, you know, younger generation of people are more likely to be communicating using email, WhatsApp, text messages, and not picking up the phone and making a call. But actually, that's not, in my eyes, a problem with people that we need to fix. That's an understanding of a group of consumers' needs that we can meet better uh, with better tools and systems. So actually, if we know that the people who are opening their first bank accounts now don't want to make telephone calls, um, then it means there's much more onus on developing really great web chats and being able to communicate with your customers in a better and more uh, responsive way, which is also going to better meet the needs of consumers with mental health problems. 
but not everybody. So mm. ultimately it comes down to having choice as it does with many things really, that there will be some people for whom telephone calls are awful, they don't want to make them and they want to be able to communicate in web chat, but there will always be another group of customers who say actually uh, web chat is too stressful or I don't have access to the technology or I don't feel comfortable using that and instead I want to either go into a branch or make a telephone call, uh, which is an annoying answer if you're someone who's developing a tool. Uh, but it does just suggest that the way in which we design banks needs to have multiple access points for people with different needs, whether that's because of age, mental health, physical health, sensory impairments, or whatever else it might be. Uh, that's, uh, it's fascinating. It's making me feel quite old, actually. I'm quite fine picking up the phone, but the idea of like, you know, having to remember the 15th password is the thing that makes me get very anxious. But um, I wonder, like... Um, Daniel, what you know about the age profile of your own customers and, and, and how far um, maybe you could do more to help some of the people that Helen's talking about. And But maybe, you, I don't know, can you also do things at the other end of the age range? Yes, yeah, so our customer demographics are very much skewed towards kind of 20 to 40 year olds, mm -hmm. as I guess you would expect, being an app-only bank. Um, uh, that's largely speaking just a correlation to people that, use smartphones and apps. Um, our support is offered predominantly over in-app chat 24 hours a day. Uh, we also do have a telephone number, but uh, we don't signpost people towards that quite heavily because we prefer them to contact us over the, the in-app chat over the phone call. Uh, and anecdotally, I'm also someone who doesn't like phoning people. So I very much <laughs> like talking to our customer support team over in-app chat rather than, than phoning them. <laughs> it does feel like a straight age thing, doesn't it? Um, uh, aha. Hmm? Don't get that excited. <laughs> <laughs> racing in. Thank you very much for um, coming um, along. Um, as it happened, we just... Um, uh, and welcome. Um, Kai, it's great to uh, great to see you. Fresh from the educa education bill of some sort. Uh, a small matter of some Brexit business and the education bill. Yes. Ah, yes, a bit of a spot of Brexit bother tonight, isn't there? Um, d it's all going very well, actually. It's all in hand. Um, uh, and um, it's great to be joined by um, Guy, who uh, is the responsible minister for this. But I know from speaking to him on previous occasions, it's something... oh, good God, uh, who's really got um, a sense of uh, mission about this, a, a, a personal sense of mission um, around making sure that everyone has got financial um, inclusion. I guess what we've been talking about so far is how you further that aim within a context where the technology is changing very, very um fast um, and um, in particular we've been hearing about um, a lot of research from Anne and Helen and Helen particularly on the sort of mental health side of things and Anne on how services are being redesigned and then Daniel's been telling us about Monzo and um, a million customers from out of nowhere in 2015-16 got to a million customers mostly uh, aged 20 to um, 40 but we've also been I'm one of them Excellent. <laughs> We've also been um, uh, like thinking about problem customers and customers that the banks might bump up against, or customers um, that feel like dealing with a bank is, is, is a bit of a, a, a bump for them. And so we were talking, for example, about self-imposed um, thresholds people can put on their spending for things like gambling. Um, but... Um, if it's not too much when you've when you've just dashed in, I wonder if we could just tell you what you think the the, the, the government's doing on this territory, and then we can. Okay, uh, shall I dive in? Yes, um, please. So, um, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Guy Opperman. Uh, I am uh, the member of parliament for Hexham. Uh, I had a whole bunch of serious and normal jobs before I did this. I was a uh, businessman. I ran a business with uh, my dad. I was a lawyer. And before that, I was a steeplechase jockey, a very fat steeplechase jockey. Uh, and famously, that uh, Tony McCoy, who I rode against, said to me, what's your real job? Which I felt was a little harsh, but very true. So uh, I pitched for the job of uh, including financial inclusion into the government's portfolio and was lucky enough to be asked by the Prime Minister to do this. 
And secondly, we then pitched to create the single financial guidance body to try and uh, bring together the various forms of money, debt and uh, pensions guidance that is out there. And um, it is something that I consider my day job is the pensions brief and my night job is the uh, financial inclusion brief. And we are trying to take forward many different uh, aspects to that. I'm, I'm happy to listen. I'm a, a, a loyal customer of Monzo. Um, but I'm also a massive believer, I suppose, in a couple of key things, which would be uh, I'm actually more optimistic for the future. In Talk Money Week, I've done a series of things this week. Uh, in terms of, I think, data is a democratizer, whether that is in terms of the engagement you now get um, through um, online banking and uh, digital banking, which never happened here. I mean, how many people here actually have met their bank manager in the last year? Stick your hand up if you <coughs> No one, of course. But if you have online banking, you're checking your banking on a regular basis. And the reality of the situation is we hope to do similar things in pensions, but uh, I think we get a situation where you look at Monzo doing good work, but I'm a massive fan of organizations like Plum, Chip, Moneybox, uh, Revolut and others who are in this particular space and are not just encouraging savings, which is what we all would like to see. And I launched yesterday the Nest Sidecar Savings event, which is, I think, a massive step forward. Many people were there last night who uh, care passionately in this particular space. But I, I'm also a believer that the nudge that we're doing in relation to auto-enrollment and in relation to the sort of thing Moneybox is doing to encourage savings can be dealt with in a reverse way. So I met with Step Change yesterday as well and discussed with uh, Peter and the team uh, the idea that you'd have a reverse uh, nudge back into alleviating your savings on an online platform. And I think that is the future in my view. And I think there is a great opportunity for that. So I'll, I'll stop there and we'll try and do some questions and things like that. Um, I've, I've got to go back to the house later on as well, which is going to be fun, uh, and the department. So I can't stay forever, but I will we'll keep going for a while. Have you got um, 20 minutes? Yeah, yeah we're, we're good for 20 minutes or so. Oh, great, great, great. Okay, there, there were other things I was going to say, but I think like because um, guys here, it would be great to um, take some questions and then maybe some of those points about data and privacy will come back to um, later. As I said, um, it's a very expert audience guy, and so we might get um, all, all, all sorts of um, thought-provoking questions. Okay, so over here, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, James, give, give it the mic. Mm. I have three things, actually, for three people. And have you oh. examined India's uh, explosion into banking industry where they got something like 60% of their population who was never into banking? They got them into banking fold. Have you examined that, and has that made any impression on you? So that's the first question. Helen, have you ever considered universal basic income as a, an important fact that will alleviate any mental health problems that people, they will have money to put in the bank or even deal with that? So that's one thing. Yep. And, and to you, Danny, have you ever considered virtual money to be given to gambling addicted people who can just gamble away thinking that they are gambling their money and yet not being affected at all. Okay. Um, should, should we just whisk through those? Did you, did you get the... I'm, I'm not quite sure I got this, the, the um, question, but I'm going to answer a question that I think I'm going to turn away. So I, if you sign that, you know, there's a lot of people that are on banks um, and what do we do? So with the current account switch service, which I'm still I'm very passionate about, mm. we actually ensure that we're everyone, all of, so we started off with 24 brands, we've got 50 and Wonzo is one of our customers. And what we're looking at is we're looking at different markets, so maybe the prepaid credit card market, to ensure that we provide a hub that anyone wants to provide them to switch from one bank account to another is able to do not only in a, a safe and secure way, but they're able to do so quickly and efficiently. So I think what I what I'm, 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 I may not answer the right question, but I'm saying actually we we work with the community and all of the our partners to ensure that what's required in the centre is available. Okay, let's um, whiz across, because that was a very sneaky three questions in one for a first question, but they're all pithy enough to get away with it. Um, uh, Daniel, what, um, what, what did you make of that question? Um, it's a very interesting idea. I'd be interested to know what people with gambling addictions think. Uh, 
Part of me thinks there are lots of apps you can download on the App Store to gamble with virtual money. So I wonder whether kind of the thrill they get is the fact that it's real money and they they wouldn't find this particularly appealing. But I I, I, I don't really know. But doesn't it? I mean, it can some forms of virtual money turn into real money, don't they? I don't even mean Bitcoin. I mean stuff on video games. You can kind of cash in, can't yes. you? Yes, yes. Um, but then I guess as soon as it's can turn into real money, it's still gambling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then on the question about universal income, and there's a sort of flip side of that, which um, is universal credit, which isn't universal at all in that sense, universal in that several benefits becoming one, but has, I'm sure... I think it was about universal basic income. Yes, yeah. yes, but I was just thinking that with, with, with your, um, yeah, yeah. like, thinking about financial security and... Um, people with mental health problems. I just wondered if yeah. benefit policy, which the gentleman's getting Absolutely. at, was, has been important or not. Um, so as you were cheeky and asked three questions, I'm going to be cheeky and also answer that one, if that's all right, on uh, gambling, which was just to say that uh, we did do some research looking at the um, kind of intrinsic motivations uh, that drive problem gambling. And for some people, there is an enjoyment in the actual gambling activity whether that enjoyment comes from the potential to win real money or whether it comes from the activity of playing poker or bingo varies. So for somebody who's just enjoying the gambling activity, it's worth a, tr a try, it could work. Um, but also, but for a lot of people, there are other motivations, some of which are financial, so um, taking the money out of it wouldn't necessarily work. But there was a group of people that we found in our research, particularly people with mental health problems, for whom gambling was a real social activity and an important connection to other people with shared interests in a sport or in uh, what a poker, whatever the activity is. So when we're thinking about addressing problem gambling, it's important that it's not just about taking away someone's ability to gamble, but replacing the need that they are meeting with the gambling. So making sure that they have an alternative social network or social activity or something else that they can do that is enjoyable in its place. Um, so, and on the question about income, we haven't done any research on universal basic income per se, and I'd be interested to see if there is any on that and on how it might uh, support people with mental health problems. But we have done quite a bit of research on uh, the impact of having a sustainable income on your mental health and also on uh, the impact that fluctuations in your income can have on your mental health and well-being. We recently brought out research looking at the impact of periods of workplace sickness absence and found that for many people with mental health problems, the financial difficulty caused by the sickness absence is worsening their mental health and lengthening the period of absence um, and actually suggested some really practical changes that you could make to sick pay and some changes to benefits as well um, that would ease that financial burden and, and smooth people's journey, whether that is out of work and into kind of off work support or whether that is a short term period of absence and back into work again. Minister, unless you want to weigh in on any of those, we should maybe get, would you like to or should we just get you another? Crack on and I'll, I'll come in when I've heard a few. Okay. Uh, so look, um, right, let's, let's start over here. Yeah, with you. Yeah. Um, is there a mic, James? You got one? Uh, David Steele from the Money Charity and formerly um, Age UK as well. Um, I wanted to raise the thorny issue of bank branches and uh, it's related also to cash machines and um, the question about whether there can be technologically uh, creative solutions for maintaining analog coverage. Um, and as members of the panel will know, you know, there are developing around the country bank branch deserts we're possibly going to see cash machine deserts as well. Um, and the banks up to now have, um, have been very resistant to the idea of collaboration or a universal service approach to dealing with these, uh, these problems, which can be terribly intense if, if you've got an area that has um, poor mobile coverage or poor um, internet coverage as well. And, and Helen Goodman in, the, um, in the, the publication has directly addressed this issue. And I, I found it very frustrating in discussion with the banks to, to find the banks saying individually, no, no, we can't do that, we're not interested in doing that, you know, we are a separate bank, mm. we have our own brand, etc. And so you see it, places in the country going from four branches of different banks to no branches. And what the locals say is, um, surely we could have a, a shared facility, a shared banking facility. 
And you would think that with the way that technology is going, that that type of solution would be practical. Um, a shared uh, cash point, for example. Well, or, a, sh- or a, a, shared, a shared virtual banking facility, for example, where you could go into a community centre and you could talk to any bank through the technology okay. and, yeah. and get the uh, effect of an analogue service but delivered somehow digitally or within a, within a community space. Okay. And it, it's just frustrating that there, you know, there's this narrative about new technology bounding forward, but it's not being used yet to address what is a basic need for probably millions of people around the country who are finding themselves excluded by um, the, you know, the analogue closures. Okay, so, sorry to go on a bit. No, 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 it's fine. Sort of, um, um, and question. if you would you like to say anything on this first, and then we'll, and then we'll see what Kai wants to take. I mean, from a CAS perspective, yeah. we we ensure that all channels are available to all of our our, our um, participants, and we ensure that we have a level playing field. I think I can't really have comment on the cash machines because that's yeah. not something that we would be involved. Don't worry, in. I can. Yeah, Great. We were. Yeah. So I'd start by saying turn to page 18 in this excellent um, uh, brochure and read the piece that I wrote on this exact point. Um, the first thing I would say is that uh, community banking in an alternative uh, format is a very good way forward. And I set up. I have the most rural constituency in the country. Um, you know, I, I laugh at people down here who say I haven't got a bra- uh, bank branch within a mile when I represent 1,250 square miles. Um, it takes me two and a quarter hours to drive across my constituency. Um, you know, that's the equivalent of London to Bristol. Um, these are pretty punchy distances, uh, and there are people who are 30 miles from a bank branch quite comfortably, if not more. So uh, we have addressed that. We've created community banks. Um, I backed an organization called Atom, which is an online banking um, platform. It's got my entire life savings in it, and I work in it and help it as much as I possibly could. But Obviously, I'm not involved at the present stage as I can't be. But um, And then I would also say, so we've done practical things like we're in negotiations as government to uh, resolve a, uh, an agreement between uh, the post office and various other facilities. Obviously, you can utilise, no one knows this, but you can utilise the post office as a banking facility if you're a member of a mainstream bank. Uh, you can increasingly utilise a post office as part of a credit union, and that's being expanded massively. And the reality of the situation is that the post office is like this because, of course, most of them are now not in what you and I would call traditional post offices. They're now in the WH Smiths, the stops, shops and uh, normal uh, retail outlets. And so they're more and more they are becoming a, f- a focus point of a village or a community. And certainly I have significant towns of 3,000 people without a bank, but they do have a post office. That would be the other way forward. And to slightly go back to the gentleman's point about um, Indian banking, the, the reality of the situation is is that uh, online banking through uh, the African experience and other experiences that started out, you know, I lived and worked in Africa and no one went to a bank because they always got robbed. Um, so mm. obviously that's how online banking developed uh, in a way that uh, was secure. That is the future and that is where we're going. It is difficult if there isn't broadband in the particular area, but more and more that has been covered. Okay. Um, Unless, would, that, would, yeah. would you like to? Yes, please. Yeah, just very briefly. So we, um, we've just completed a piece of research for the Access to Cash review, uh, which isn't published yet, but um, I can give you a few headlines from it. But broadly, we found it needs that kind of twin track approach. So both community banking and giving people access to cash and actual cash when they need that and banking services. But when we looked at uh, what challenges people faced without access to cash, Some of that was around online banking and banking technology that didn't meet their needs. So they were using cash instead of using a digital system that wasn't working. So for example, around supported third party access to banking services. So if somebody has a carer taking out a certain amount of cash, giving it to them and saying for the weekly shop, or this is the amount of money that you can use to support me, when actually if we can have carer's cards or cards with two sets of PIN numbers, one for the carer and one for the main account holder with different sets of permissions, you get around that and suddenly you don't need access to a cash point. And similarly, budgeting support built in through your digital banking 
can meet some people's needs where otherwise what they're doing is taking out their cash for the week and splitting it into pots of money for different things. So we need to both ensure that we protect access to cash and face-to-face -face banking services for the people that want that, but at the same time develop digital banking services that meet some of the need that currently cash is filling and not always filling that well. Great stuff. Do you want to add anything on this or shall we? Uh, no, I thought Guy's answer was basically what I was going to say. Okay. Hurrah. <laughs> uh, right, on the front, let's have a... Yeah, is there a, is there a mic? Do you want to do a series of questions? Sure. Let's, let's take three, so if people yeah. could be quite... Um, yeah, iffy. yeah. Uh, Minister, uh, sorry, my name is Mick McAteer from the Financial Inclusion Centre. Uh, very interested and surprised to hear you say data is democratising. Uh, and, and I explain why it's not on page 14 of the, of the same publication. There, there are a few iron laws in financial services, but one of the few iron laws is, is that the more profiling you have, the more segmentation you have, the more exploitation the more discrimination and the more exclusion you have. That, 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 trust me, I've been doing this for 25 years. That's how it goes, you know. I mean, and there, there are two good examples recently where institutions have not used technology to support consumers, and another example of where they've used technology to exploit consumers. The first example is in the overdraft market. You know, the FCA has recently found that actually it's best disabled people, people from black and minority ethnic communities, and single parent households and the most deprived areas of the country are paying twice as much for the overdraft charges, even though technology means that there doesn't have to be a distinction now between unarranged overdraft charges and arranged overdraft charges. The technology is already there. They're not using the technology to actually benefit consumers. I don't see any reason what I don't see any, I don't see what has changed. There's never been a competitive advantage in good conduct. So I don't see what has changed. But the other example is in the insurance market recently, uh, last week in fact, the FCA put, put out a great piece of research showing that actually that the boards of insurance companies don't understand their pricing models and they may well be buying data sets that allow profiling according to ethnicity. Now as I say, if you think data is democratising then you know, we, we should have a chat. You know, okay, well uh, let's um, uh, pass the mic back, let's, if we're in a... Dins, quickly, let's do one here, and, then, and please keep it tight if you can, just so we can make sure. We get uh, 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 Alistair Smith, I'd like to make a comment on the earlier discussion about about bank branching. I, I chaired the CMA's retail banking investigation. We didn't look much at ba at branch banking, but I was very interested in what Helen Goodman said in Prospect oh, yeah. that 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 banks are reluctant to get into collaborative arrangements about bank branch provision because they feel it would fall foul of competition legislation. Well, I have to say in two years of running the Competition, market, competition Markets Authority inquiry into retail banking, no bank ever asked us the question, would there be a competition problem if we collaborated in the provision of branches? And the answer to that question is pretty obviously, no, there wouldn't be. Okay, so competition branches, and then yes, one along here. Let's just, for efficiency, let's Keep in the small area. Sure. Hi, I'm Sammy. I'm starting a company doing customer onboarding using open banking. My question is, given current trends in technology, um, what are some of the parts of financial inclusion that you see getting better? And we've touched on that a bit already. And what are some of the parts that you see getting worse in, say, 10 years' time? Mm. Shall I dive in? Yes, please so, do, um, and in a way that in the same With no sort of disrespect to Mr. McAteer, we fundamentally disagree. Um, and I, I set out that at page 18, which I think trumps your page 14, but that's, a, that's another... <laughs> um, but that's, a, that's for another day. And um, the nuts and bolts of it is, uh, I think... Uh, I'd be curious on the Monzo take here, but I have... Uh, I've seen uh, businesses like Chip who allow uh, you to access your... A bank account and then effectively save you money on an ongoing basis by assessing your particular um, bills and reducing your outgoings. I have seen the impact of Moneybox. As a government minister, I have to say there are other products out there. I think it's a fantastic company. I think it, the way that it nudges people through smart data into a better savings pattern is phenomenal and the take up is superb. And yes, I don't dispute in any way that data can be abused. It was ever thus, and no one uh, doubts that as a 
uh, the, the, the abuse of any information can be can take place. But as a fundamental principle, uh, does transparency and access to information in a um, in a way uh, that is allows everybody to have access to it. Uh, most of all, the individual, and I, 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 raised, I started with the principle of who here has seen their bank manager, but who actually engages with their bank on online banking. <coughs> that is the funda- Wow, that was... Actually. Sorry, <laughs> the microphone's um, scary, isn't it? Um, that was the best barrack of the night. Um, <laughs> the, um, but the, the, the fundamental principle that, I, that all of us can go home and have access to our information and then come to judgment decisions on ourselves. Uh, on our own finances, it seems to me, is a total democratizer, and something should be applauded. Now, there needs to be safeguards as well, but um, you can shake your head all you like, but the bottom line is this. I would have access, as all of these people do, by way of online banking, to my information. Now, uh, that access is just not there if you're existing off paper and going, having to go into stores and things like that. So that would be my, my strong view on that. I'll, 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 it leads nicely on to the, to the other point, which is, so uh, I see I'm in charge of pensions and I'm trying to help in the financial inclusion space with Treasury. But so aside from six years bashing Germans, my uh, <laughs> beloved grandfather worked in the same job from the age of 14 until 65. He had a current account, a savings account and a pension. And they're all very distinct and they never changed. Now, the, those, those days are light years away, all right? We're all, we're all going to be in online banking going forward. That's the inevitable, um, you know, the banks are going to close an awful lot more branches. And, and we're going to be moving into a data device. Uh, everything is going to be accessible on your mobile phone on an ongoing basis. Uh, your savings, increasingly that's, the space has been got into by um, the disruptors and they are going to be in uh, on your phone as well so your bank and your savings um, product will be in the same place and accessible in the same place and pretty soon they'll merge the two uh, you know you've got a situation money box is partly owned by legal and general uh, you know the starlings the monzos will be bought out sorry but you will be um, by <laughs> various of these other businesses as they go forward and you'll see an amalgamation in the market and pensions will follow in my view and i've made it very clear in my view Eventually, within 10 years' time, you'll be able to see all of your financial products in one place on your mobile phone so that you and I can commute to work, take the tube, do whatever we want to do, take the bus, and we can check up on our financial status. Now, that, in my view, is a democratizer and does enable people. Although, sorry to interject, but an awful lot's then going to depend on competition, isn't there? Because if it's one point of access and one mighty company owning everything... Um, you no, need to be, make there's, sure there's, listen, there's already, my lordy, there's, uh, my problem is I've got too many pension companies. I have thousands and thousands of pension companies. I'd rather they consolidate as I'm trying to make them do. Um, the disruptors, the banks are, the, the, if you're with a pre-existing bank, your worry is Monzo and others because they are hoovering up the customers quite clearly. And the, the two are going to merge together. So the traditional big banks and the disruptors, the, either, they, either one buys the other out or they merge in some shape or form. They can't both exist on an ongoing basis, I suspect. But hey, I'm not in charge of how they run their businesses. Here's someone who might be, though. Uh, what do you think, Daniel? Um, I think data is an enabler. Uh, it, if you are a good company, it lets you do more good. And if you're a bad company, it lets you do more bad. Um, I think if you are in a competitive market, customers will pick good companies. Historically, we haven't been in a competitive market. like. If you had one bank that charges you loads of unauthorized overdraft fees and a, a fee for declining a transaction um, and a bank that doesn't, there's no rational reason why you wouldn't switch to the other bank other than the, the barrier to switching being too high. And, and things like CAS make, like lower that barrier. And there's still a lot of, lot of way to go to get more and more people switching and increase the competition in the market. There are lots of things like, Frankly, I don't think there's any reason why charging someone a fee for declining a transaction shouldn't just be illegal, like it doesn't cost a bank anything. There's no reason why that should be even allowed. We don't do it. There's no reason why you shouldn't just, the default behavior being if, if someone doesn't have the money to decline the transaction, don't charge them for it. Lloyds have a feature that costs £10 a month to not be charged unauthorized overdraft fees. Ludicrous. Why is that not the default behavior? Like, but I do believe that now that there are banks that don't do that, for example, Monzo, over time, 
people will switch. They will have to change their practices or they'll lose their customers. Maybe I'm wrong and maybe... But you're losing 33 million pounds this year, aren't you? We he's, are. he's what's called a startup, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. We are. That's correct. We're not making a profit. However, on every additional customer today, we do make a profit. Mm. So a lot of last year's financial, that we way. make a profit. Um, and I wonder if you'd like to um, add anything on this, because one of the principles you talked about at the beginning was this business of not discriminating. And um, I know that in other markets, some of them financial, like insurance and so on, there's a lot of concern or at least questions and law around discrimination and data, isn't there? Is that something you see as um, a, yeah. a, a, an opportunity or a threat more when you think about this? I mean, without being boring, it's both. Mm. So um, in the insurance market, there is a clear risk and we uh, so we have done a small amount of research into travel insurance specifically and mental health problems uh, because insurance is a tricky one because the way that insurance companies calculate risk is private. It's competitive information and you can't get access to that as a consumer or as a consumer organisation. So all we can see on the outside is that uh, from a sample of customers with mental health problems, they're being charged more for their insurance premiums if they disclose a mental health problem than if they disclose, for example, a back problem, which to the customer feels as though it presents a reasonably similar additional risk to the insurance company. Uh, but what we can't get access to is how that risk is calculated. And in an insurance market that operates as ours does, it's reasonable to assume that you pay more if you have a pre-existing condition because you present a greater risk to the company that you're paying to provide you with the service. Um, so what we need to make sure is that those companies aren't uh, taking an assessment of risk that is based on not up to date or inaccurate data, because that's how you determine that it's not a breach of the Equality Act and you're not discriminating against someone on the grounds of a protected characteristic, but you're instead taking an accurate assessment of how that might affect their risk. So. On the insurance side of things, what we'd really like to see is the Financial Conduct Authority expanding their work to look at household insurance, to also look at insurance that has a health-based risk assessment element, and to be really looking at how different conditions affect it. They recently did a piece of work looking at cancer and insurance risk. Um, I'm not sure why it was specifically focused on cancer. Um, I think it would be useful to take a broader look at different mm. pre-existing conditions. Um, the conclusion of that piece of work was to create a new signposting service to signpost people to specialist insurers. So if you go to uh, through a comparison site or to a mainstream insurer, disclose a pre-existing condition, that means that you either can't get access to insurance or that your premiums are very high, you get signposted to a specialist insurer. But the questions you get asked around mental health are generally, have you ever experienced a mental health problem? half of the population will experience a mental health problem. I don't think that's a specialist market. So I think there is a case for uh, the Financial Conduct Authority to look at how the mainstream insurance market is meeting the needs of that group of consumers. Um, on the product, the question about financial inclusion, um, I think we've, I haven't really touched on that one. Mm -hmm. um, I think, in honesty, the areas in f of financial inclusion that are likely to improve the fastest are those that are also in line with the general direction of travel of both technology and banking services more broadly. And that's not to say that they're not important, but areas around personalization and tools that provide greater control and greater insight into data and nudging to enable people to stay in control of their money. They're things that will help more vulnerable groups of customers, uh, but will also be more widely available. Um, and things around, so tools around income smoothing and making financial products a better fit with today's working environment. So designing uh, payment systems and products that work for people whose income doesn't come in once a month in a single chunk, but actually uh, comes in on an ad hoc basis. So making sure that you're not financially penalised for not being able to use direct debits because you don't know when you're going to get paid. I think that cracking that is mm. going to be an enormous step towards uh, improving financial inclusion. One area that we were discussing earlier where I think there's still a lot of progress that needs to be made is around ID. So enabling people who don't have access to good ID to open. Uh, you're smiling, I don't know if that's what you're building, but um, if it is, I didn't know. Thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I just come yes. in? So I the, go ahead. I think just, I just come in as very well. quickly. So, yeah. um, Sidecar savings seems to me is, you know, access to rainy day money 
is the utter key for so many of the financial inclusion issues. And Sidecar would be, uh, which Nest are launching with Harvard and various other pretty punchy um, support groups, would seem to me a very, very, very good way forward. And then um, we've set we up... Should just, this is sort of where you so can I'll, spend I'll, a little bit of your pension, isn't it? Well, basically, that money that comes into your bank account then goes out into a side... Uh, a, what they call a sidecar with a separate rainy day fund, mm. and that uh, ebbs and flows depending on usage of that fund and usage of any other monies. The principal, obviously, is for those who are in employment and who've got money coming in, but the principal, once established and once you get the systems working, can be expanded for others. Uh, one would also say that you could easily look at that in relation to other other products as well. Insurance is an obvious example. Um, and you then hopefully would get a provider who would get into that space. Uh, the other thing I would say is that for the, anybody who hasn't looked at what the single financial guidance body is doing, particularly for the vulnerable, uh, and what Hector Sanson, who is the former um, chief executive of Step Change, uh, is taking forward. They should look at that because the, when I passed the bill last year in the Commons, uh, we made it absolutely clear that their, one of their prime focuses is on access to financial services for the vulnerable. And that is what they are specifically looking at. Terrific. Thank you. And Anne? And I, I was really just going to uh, support what Helen was saying. I mean, the payment systems have a wealth of information, not just the cash service. I mean, I'm talking about the, the direct debit. So <coughs> we can see from a central perspective what is going through accounts. So I think when it comes back to that information could be used in a more appropriate way to help vulnerable customers when they need it most, not just at bank account level. But more importantly, you have to do that in a safe way. And I think if we've, we've also written a white paper recently where we were saying, with the advent of open banking, and yes, I've got a Bean account and I've looked at all of those Moneybox accounts, because I think what will happen is that um, consumers will get more complex banking arrangements with multiple providers. And therefore, I think it's about actually ensuring that they're getting the best deals rather than actually what's the, the, no, the, the most... But, but do you agree problem. that they will be that the, the process of data and accessibility to that will, to take the Monzo point, they're going to be more engaged with their finances? I think it's... As, but then you've got certain customers that are not able to be engaged. And I think what we need to do is actually understand how we can provide that data in an accessible information in an accessible way. <laughs> okay, fan fantastic. Now let's take um, two more and then we're, we'll be up against it, but we will have a chance to go upstairs and, and, and continue the conversation with a drink in our hand uh, in, in, in a moment. Um, I'm conscious everyone who's asked a question is a bloke. Um, <laughs> I don't obsess about these things, but it seems a bit, a bit skewed. Have we got a, any women who want to ask a question? Yeah, there we go. Let's take one from you, madam. And then uh, this chap here. Um, hi, I'm Joanna Finley, oh, yeah, okay. um, Virgin Money. Yeah. Um, I suppose, I mean, I was scribbling down a lot of questions. I'm, I'm interested either in the role of technology and how we can motivate people to engage with this information, because I often think having information available doesn't necessarily... You're already doing it. It's called Lifesavers. You back it. Yeah, OK. So keep going, I shouldn't <laughs> That's all right. Um, and, and so maybe the role of technology in the future, how we can motivate people more to engage with their finances. Um, and the other one that I was thinking about is um, the role of tech to help people avoid debt um, in the first place and the ethical dilemmas around people having the choice to have the finances that they want, um, but banks nudging people in the direction of what would be financially beneficial for them. Thank you very much indeed. So sort of nudge type question. And then there was another one here. And then there's also one on, on, on the front with Tony. Uh, this is a question directly to Guy. Um, we're at a tipping point uh, with regard to pensions. Uh, we have open banking. We don't have open pensions. Uh, it could well be that we revert to a sort of very old fashioned model. Or we could go the API model and democratize pension information the way banking has been democratized. Which way do you want to go? Uh, the latter. We're going to do a thing called Pensions Dashboard. The feasibility study will be out shortly. Um, and you will see when we publish that uh, that it is most definitely not a traditional paper-based model, that this is trying to democratise it, trying to bring... So, you know, everyone here who is employed uh, in a private sector business will have a auto-enrolled pension. Uh, that takes 5% of your 
earnings. Uh, you're in a situation that you will move jobs and you'll be doing to a new provider. Uh, trying to keep track of that is difficult. Um, that's why you should be able to go home, turn on your computer, access, you know, put in certain key um, finding uh, tools, whether it's your national insurance number or something uh, identical to particular, to particular to you. And you should then be able to bring down all your various pension information. And that is the proposal that we are looking at. We're about to study a feasibility study on that. The lady's question, Lindsay, from Virgin Money. Well, I love Virgin Money because um, if you want an example of better education, if you want an example of uh, engagement and uh, changing behavior and um, proper nudge factor, then I cannot recommend highly enough the Lifesavers project. So Lifesavers is run by Treasury. It's funded by Treasury. It's supported and paid for partly by Virgin Money. And it's uh, supported by the Church of England. And they then have a whole series of schools in this country uh, that the Lifesavers project go out and they effectively run a bank in the schools. And the uh, impact on that community, I picked. So my bank, when I set up the Northumberland Community Bank, I picked the two of the most socially deprived areas of my community uh, in the east end of Hexham and um, in another particular part of, in toward Hayden Bridge. The change in behaviour by the pupils is phenomenal in terms of their awareness and understanding of money. The change in behaviour by the adults is fascinating as well and uh, with, the, with the passage of time we'll be able to see and be able to measure in a proper empirical way them going home to mum and dad and saying, well, I've got savings, I'm saving for X, Y, Z. Are you doing this? Which in this particular community makes a massive difference. Mm -hmm. The evidence is fantastically overwhelming that it's very good. Um, potentially, I'd very much like Virgin Money to commit some more money to it, please. Um, but the bottom line is this, that is a fantastic thing. Fantastic. Um, and I know we, we promised you a question as well. Um, Thank you. Um, it's a question for Guy again, please. Um, what's uh, fascinating, I'm Tony from the Emerging Payments Association, and we represent 135 companies, all passionate about, uh, in particular, financial inclusion and seeing what we can do collectively to raise the bar of standards to help organisations become um, better at solving problems for both the vulnerable and the excluded. Um, we're about to launch something called the Inclusion Signpost. It's an accreditation tool that will help that to happen. Um, what I'm open to is hearing from you, Guy, what you look to the industry that is supportive of, of the government's um, agenda on, on inclusion. What would you like us to do? So I'm delighted to answer that. I'll give the same answer I gave last night, uh, where some people who are here tonight listened to me say it, um, which is slightly, if you want to change the world, look in a mirror. So... Uh, the first question you ask yourself is, what does my company do for financial inclusion and uh, awareness? And I'm stunned and amazed how many times I ask people whether they engage, particularly financial services companies, whether they engage their own staff uh, with issues of financial inclusion, whether there is any kind of advice given to their staff, whether they um, have uh, any particular policies that are different. Um, so we're pioneering and trying to support things like the Midlife MOT, which is a evaluation of wealth, work and well-being. Uh, the impact from the Aviva trial, if you haven't read the Aviva trial, I really urge you to see so. Amazing impact on, everybody thought it would be very good for the employee, but it was also brilliant for the business because their retention of employees by reason of doing the midlife MOT uh, was phenomenal uh, in circumstances where people were about to leave and they actually then engaged, went for longer term, retrained and changed their behavior. And more particularly, um, driving change within the financial services community would be a good start. Um, and then piloting and understanding what works and what does not work. So I give you the Midlife MOT as an example, but there are other things that you can do to ask uh, your individual staff, which you already do an HR assessment every year, are you happy with the job, etc. Uh, do you have an understanding of what your pension position is? Do you have an understanding, do you have an overdraft? Have you thought about paying that off? Do you have a credit card bill? What, is there any kind of uh, financial assessment? We do all of this. So if you are reach my age, you get lots and lots of very robust texts and emails from your doctor telling you that various bits of your anatomy are about to fail if you don't go and see uh, him or her very soon. Uh, similarly, our dentists send us very robust uh, texts and emails saying that basically we've got to go and see them because public health has done an amazing job at engaging with us and doing preventative medicine. We don't do this in finance. And uh, there is no engagement 
an assessment, and I would guarantee that 50% of the audience here have not really done that sort of thing themselves. They're constantly preaching it to other people, and we talk about it all the time, but are you doing it to your staff? And if we started with that, there is the, the follow-on from that, and I'll cut myself short there. Um, the follow-on from that is government is good at stuff, but it's slow and it's quite uh, clunky and it has to consult a great deal, whereas businesses can move really quickly. So if you, know, if you run a business here, I was with JP Morgan last night and I was saying to them, have you done this? And they were going, well, not necessarily. We probably need to have a look at it. I don't know. Virgin Money, Jane Guardian and I used to have a chat about these things. Um, slightly, they can react quite quickly. And then they can give evidence quite quickly as well. So the Aviva trial didn't even exist until I managed to persuade their chief executive that what they really wanted to do was a midlife MOT of all their Norwich, all their Norwich employees. So everybody between the age of 45 and 60 uh, was gone through in a really detailed assessment of their wealth, their work, and their well-being. And the interesting thing is the business found it was fantastic. The employees loved it, but the business thought it was an amazing thing. That then formulates future government policy, because effectively you're doing all the individual pilots and coming back and saying, this works, this doesn't work, that's good, that doesn't. In my way, that's the best way forward. Fantastic, Guy. Thank you very, very much. And let's... Um just whiz back across the panel, um, starting with Helen. Um, if anyone else has got um, any responses to that final round of questions or just other closing thoughts, and then we will wrap up and, as I say, continue the conversation with a glass of wine in our hands upstairs. Uh, so first thought on what firms can do, um, as well as agreeing with all of that, actually the point that I particularly want to echo is around evaluating what you're doing and not just evaluating it, but making that available. Um, because particularly when we're working in financial services, it's a very competitive space. But when we're looking at whether that's your employees or your customers, how you can improve financial inclusion and well-being, the more that we can learn from each other's successes, but also mistakes, the more progress we can make. Um, and it's definitely not a kind of zero sum game when it comes to well-being. If your team or your customers are happier, uh, that doesn't mean that your competitors need to be less happy uh, or less kind of financially uh, safe. So the more that we can evaluate what's happening, but also publish that. Uh, so I would I've seen some encouraging figures about Monzo's gambling block in terms of uptake. Uh, and it's been really great that that's been shared publicly and about some of the impacts. And one of the things I found refreshing was that uh, Monzo were quite open about some of the challenges, was that yes, people were blocking their gambling transactions, but for some people, uh, the cash withdrawals were going up at the same time. Um, so if you're seeing cash withdrawals going up when you've turned on the gambling block, mm. then you need to look at whether you can also give people the option to reduce their ATM limit at the same time. And by publishing that, you've informed the design of other products and services for the better. Um, and on the question about how you encourage people to take up financial technology, um, I think it's just about making it really good. Um, because people don't have time in their life for extra things and particularly if you're aiming at a group of people who are in debt because actually being in financial difficulty is exhausting it takes up lots of time it takes up lots of energy just opening all the post uh, and balancing the bills is a really all-consuming activity so if you can create technology that is not an extra thing that people need to do but is something that makes the existing bits of their life and their financial management quicker and easier then people will use it, so long as it's also accessible. Thank you very much. Nice challenge for you, there, Daniel, with just make it really good. Um, I'm going to touch on the point around the kind of misaligned incentives that can occur within a bank where, for example, we make more money if someone owes us money um, and we could mm -hmm. potentially stop them from owing us money, but there's a misaligned incentive where we will make more money if we don't do that. And I don't know what the answer is to that. Like, I know that what we do, for example, is if you had £100 in your bank balance and you've got a £500 direct debit coming up tomorrow, we'll tell you today that you have that payment coming up tomorrow and that will take you into your overdraft if you don't do something about it. Now, we do that because we believe it's the right thing to do. We know that other people won't do that because it will impact the amount of revenue they make. And may maybe that is a, a place where the regulators step in and say, like, come on, that's something that's not very hard to do. That now just has to be standard. Um, that's perhaps a question for the regulator of why they might feel what, like, one argument could be that kind of is a barrier to uh, kind of new entrants. If you have all of these things that you have to kind of implement before you can be a bank, 
it might be harder to start a new bank. So maybe one answer to that is, unless you're a bank above a certain size, you don't have to meet all of these requirements. But we would certainly welcome more legislation in some of those areas where there are misaligned incentives. Something very different from a traditional bank there. But we did. Uh, the, the law was changed. I mean, just briefly, the law was changed in the Financial Services Act um, uh, through George Osborne to make it much easier uh, to set up a smaller bank. That used to have £100 million worth of capital sitting on account for two years before you could even set up. So it is an awful lot easier than it used to be, but your nudge theory is a fair point. Thanks again, um, Guy. And then finally, Anne. I mean, I, I'm just going to end up on the, the fact that when we opened the current account switch service, which is all about competition and ensuring customers could you look for different products that have different features. We started off with 24 members. We've now got to nearly 55. However, we're looking at other markets now. It's not just your traditional banks. Yes, you've allowed challenger banks coming on board. But I think there are more other products, the prepaid market is one, that actually have the features that are actually more appropriate for people that are financially excluded. So from my perspective, it's all around actually understanding and ensuring that if customers want to use that, those type of products, they're available, that they are aware of them, but it's done in a safe way, so they don't feel that they're actually <coughs> buying. I tried to buy, sign up to um, on an open banking app. I asked my bank, is that okay, just because I was being naughty, and they came back and said, well, you do it on your own risk. So I think it's from a, we all need to work together to ensure that consumers feel comfortable that they can use these new products in the new way. Thank you very much um, indeed um, and um, thanks um, to you personally and also to um, Cass um, more, more generally for getting behind this event and kickstarting what is um, I think we all agree a very important discussion and um, something that you know brings together technology, economics but also social policy as we're hearing it you know you can't have social inclusion without financial inclusion we've heard that throughout the evening in all sorts of um, different ways. Thanks to all of you um, in the audience for coming along, for listening and for getting stuck in with some um, very um, uh, well informed and in some cases challenging questions. That's good, good to have. Do, if you've not done so, pick up a copy of uh, uh, this report and look through it. Um, lots of people in the room have written in it. It's got some really um, top-notch um, stuff and prospects. Certainly proud to be behind it, as I know um, Cass are as well. Um, so thanks to all of you and thanks um, to all uh, four of our uh, panellists. And as I say, let's go upstairs.